Well, welcome back to the show that never ends. I really appreciate your willingness to continue to show up for several reasons. One, it encourages the speaker. And also, this room always starts out so cold, and if there's, they have to do that, because if they don't, we would be burning up by the time we finish. But if if you all show up, we're fine. But if a lot of you decide to stay in your staterooms for any particular talk, the rest of us could freeze to death if you're not here sharing your warmth. So we're glad you come. Thanks for being here. i got a couple of announcements to make before we get started. First, um, a couple... Several people had asked me about a reading list, and the headquarters of Windstar, at the previous Wonders of Arabia cruise, they had sent out a reading list in advance. And when somebody asked me, I realized, wait, we didn't get one either early on. So we do have copies of this front and back. My lovely wife, Carolyn, at the van of this cruise, has got the reading list right there. Um, and there's some very good books on here. I want to mention a couple of them to you. One, a book by Scott Anderson that just came out in 2014, called Lawrence in Arabia. Not Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence in Arabia. Uh, my wife and I both read that book. A lot of people in the last cruise had read it. It is an excellent book. It is a factual history, but it is fascinating. It reads like a, you know, a mystery thriller. It not only deals with Lawrence, but with several other characters that were players during the time prior to and during the First World War and the era of revolt. I really strongly recommend that book to you. You'll enjoy it if you like that sort of thing at all. Another book you, uh, I'll tell you about, there's a book on here called Married to a Bedouin. It's by a woman named Marguerite von Geldermalsen. She was a New Zealand nurse who came to this region many, many years ago and met a Bedouin and ended up marrying him and having a family and living in one of the caves in the city of Petra. I reason, I, I mentioned that to you, I have not read the book, but a number of people had. The reason I mentioned it to you though is Unless she's on vacation in Dubai or something when we get there, she has a stand. There, there no longer are any Bedouins living in Petra. They're not allowed to stay there at night anymore. They used to. Uh, but she has a stand there, and she sells her books and some other things as well, and she will autograph the book for you if you're interested in that when we get to Petra. Now, I'm not swearing she'll be there. Like I say, she may have a commitment somewhere else. But she was there when we were, uh, when we were in Petra last October. So uh, that's a possibility. There are several others. There is a book on here by Karen Armstrong, and she's a fairly popular author. She's got a book called Islam, A Short History. There are a lot of books that you can read about Islam. Um, hers is not my favorite, and so I just have to tell you that's entirely subjective. I find her books to be slanted. So I'll warn you, if you read Karen Armstrong's book, Islam, A Short History, I didn't put together this list, then balance it out with some other things, okay? There's even a book on here by Robert Irwin called Camel. It's about camels. And I gotta get that one. My wife and I love camels. So if you would like a copy of this, you could pick it up from Carolyn. We did not print enough for everybody, thinking that not everyone would want one, especially since we're already, you know, in, in the cruise. But um, if you if we run out, we'll print some more. You can either get this stuff and read it as follow-up, or it's possible in some of the places we go to, like when we were just in, in Oman, they had some books in the uh, gift shop at the Frankincense Museum. Or if you have Kindle, my wife and I are Kindle nuts, um, and you have bought some time online, you might be able to purchase some of these electronically and download them and still read them while we're on the trip. Just an idea. So that's for you if you care for it. Um, I continue to get questions throughout the day, and that's great. I love the questions. I love to have conversation. I'm always available to talk with folks. Uh, several people, three people in fact, have asked me, because this morning we talked about the children of Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the three great monotheistic Abrahamic religions, and three different people have asked me, why did the Jews not accept Jesus? And so I thought if three people asked me, there might have been that question in other people's minds. Um, first, you need to understand a lot of Jewish people did accept Jesus. All of the early converts to Christianity were Jewish. In fact, the book of Acts, which is in the New Testament, which is the story of the growth of the Christian church, the first 14 chapters of that book are entirely about Jewish converts to the faith of Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. All of the apostles were Jewish. All of the writers of the New Testament, in fact, all of the writers of the whole Bible, Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible and New Testament were Jewish, with one exception. Uh, Luke, the physician who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, was not a Jew. He was Gentile. But... It was, it was a Jewish religion up until the 15th chapter, about the middle of the book of Acts, when the question was raised because some Gentiles were converting to this faith, and they asked the question uh, of the Council of Jerusalem, the sort of uh, board of elders of the church at that time, do they have to become Jewish 
in order to be a follower of Jesus? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they, do they have to stop eating bacon? You know, uh, <laughs> do they have to follow the Jewish law? And the decision was made, no, they don't. At that point, and because Paul the Apostle saw his mission primarily to Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to tell them about Jesus, then the growth began in the Gentile world. So first, the earliest converts to Christianity were Jewish. And secondly, the reason Jews did not accept Jesus more in mass than they did was two reasons, I think. One, the Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin it was called, the Council of Elders of the Jews in Jerusalem, perceived this as a threat to their authority. That's, that's clearly indicated in the, in the New Testament writings. And so they worked very hard to suppress it and to prevent people from accepting it. Secondly, Jesus was not the kind of Messiah that the Jews had expected. They thought the Messiah was going to be like King David. He was going to be a great king, a military leader, and most especially that he was going to make them a great nation again politically, and that meant throwing the Romans out, since the Romans were controlling in the first century. Jesus didn't do those things, because his mission was very different than that. His mission was not a geopolitical kind of mission, like a, like a military leader and king, but rather a spiritual one. And so they had difficulty understanding that this was the Messiah they were looking for. All right, so those are all sort of the reasons why I think there was, a, there, there was not a larger acceptance at that time. Just following up on some of those questions. We are now going to talk about Moses, the Israelites, and the crossing of the Red Sea. And the reason I, I was prompted to do this talk is because as of day after tomorrow, we are going to be in the Red Sea. In fact, we are going to sail the whole length of the Red Sea. Um, not tonight, but tomorrow night, the night of the 30th, we will be passing through the Bab al-Mandeb, which is the strait, the narrow strait, that's between Yemen on the north side, the northeast side, and Djibouti and Eritrea on the south side. I'll show you a map in a minute. And so from that point on, until we get, well, when we stop at Safaga in Egypt and then on up, we are going to sail the entire length of the Red Sea. And so it seemed to me that while we're talking about the Red Sea, a lot of people, when you say Red Sea, if, if you're some of the folks that went to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and all that, then you think of the Red Sea and a lot of people think of Moses. So we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, and it's also of interest to people because the popular movie that's been out uh, lately, the Ridley Scott movie, Exodus, Gods and Generals, most of which was wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> people are still interested in it, and so we'll, we'll talk about that. I say wrong, it's not consistent with the Hebrew Bible account of the whole Exodus. The, the reason, too, that we want to talk about this is there is very little that has been as important in the history, certainly of Judaism, but it's even a very important story in Christianity and in Islam. Islam has the story of the Exodus as well in the Quran. And it has been one of the longest lasting traditional stories of those religions and of human history. Again, this goes back um, uh, 3,500 years ago, and yet it still is maintained. I will say right up front, because I know it's going to be a question, there is no solid archaeological evidence for any of this. But as I said this morning, there's two kinds of historical data. There is written accounts, and there is archaeological accounts. And often those, those deal with very different things, because written accounts were always educated people and usually involved the wealthy or those in power, etc. Poor people didn't write. Whereas most of the things they find, are um, archaeological, or many of the things they find, are everyday ordinary. Pottery shards are the most common kinds of archaeological evidence. And so we have to take both of those things and recognize that one writing will give us a certain kind of information, archaeology will give us another. They're not contrary to one another, they're complementary, but they don't always, you know, neither one of them tell the whole story. So we need to look at the whole thing. I think there's also truth. There may be a reason why, or reasons, why we don't find more archaeological evidence, and certainly why, given the long written history of Egypt, we don't find written accounts of the, of the uh, people of Israel, the Hebrew people, being in Egypt. We'll talk about that. Again, we're on our seventh talk. Ten more to go after this one, so uh, <laughs> we'll continue to have just a rip-roaring time here. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about introduction to Islam. A number of people have said they're looking forward to that. And then, alone in the desert, Christian monasticism in preparation for our visit to St. Catherine's. And then we have more we're going to pick up uh, in May, next month, so to speak. Uh, we right now are right about here. As I said, tomorrow night, 
we will be crossing through this narrow strait here, which is called the Bab al-Mandib. Bab al-Mandib literally means the gateway or the gate. Bab means gate. Um, the gateway of tears or the gateway of anguish. <laughs> Partly because there have been times in the past when this was a rough area for navigation and things like that, but they've got all that nailed down. They've got all that figured out now with all the all the modern uh, conveniences. And then we will sail the entire length of the Red Sea, first up to Safaya to visit Luxor, then up into one arm of it. Let me show you this. This is the whole length of the Red Sea, and we will cross through here. Here's two different. This is a, an aerial uh, uh, photograph. We will be coming up through here through the Bab el Bandib. Um, there's a narrow strait that goes between this island and Yemen, and then there's a wider strait, which is where we'll go. This is about 25 miles wide, so it's not like we're going to scrape the bumpers on the sides of the boat when we go through there. Uh, this is a this is an illustration that makes it a little easier to see. We will be having Yemen on the northeastern side, Djibouti and Eritrea on the uh, south and western side as we come up through here. This again, the whole length of the Red Sea, we will be going all the way up the right-hand arm at the north, which is the Gulf of Aqaba, to Aqaba in Jordan to visit Petra, coming back down, and then going all the way up the Gulf of Suez, the other northern arm, to the Suez Canal, and then out into the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, Athens is up here somewhere. So that's the plan. And uh, while we are thinking about, and as we get into the Red Sea, we want to talk about Crossing the Red Sea, the Exodus story, and we'll talk about um, not the version that Ridley Scott shared with you. <laughs> Why is this so important? The Exodus is the charter event for the religion, well, for the Hebrew people, but also especially for the religion of Judaism, and therefore it is a foundational event in Christianity and Islam as well, which means this is a foundational event traditional story that affects half the population of the planet. I didn't say that this morning, but when you talk about Judaism, which is small, Christianity, the largest religion, and, and Islam, the second largest religion, you're talking about half the population of our planet are either strong adherents or loose adherents, at least, to those three religions. So the Exodus is the charter myth or charter story. And myth doesn't mean false. Myth is a story that has sig greater significance than the story itself. But myth does not mean it's not true when you talk about mythology. Um, the story of the Exodus is not just, you know, the, the seas parted. It actually is the story of the enslavement of the Hebrew people in Egypt following the death of Joseph, their departure under the leadership of Moses, the revelation at Sinai of the law, and of their wanderings in the wilderness, and finally the entry into the promised land that God had said they would receive as part of his guarantee to Moses. It really is the Jewish story of God proving his power and authority and his covenant promise was true to the Hebrew people. Whereas most of the primitive polytheistic religions before Judaism were more concerned about explaining how God might exist in nature Starting with the Hebrew Bible and the call of Abraham, and most especially in the story of the Exodus, it is the story of how God dealt in history in demonstrating his power and authority in his covenant promise. So, not the nature that is being dealt with in polytheism, but God in history as he acted as a personal being in relating to those who would follow him. And the Exodus is also important because it has, it has been a symbol for so many other persecuted peoples down through history. The uh, people who fled from Europe under religious persecution to the New World looked to the Exodus story as an example of fleeing out of persecution and into freedom, especially religious freedom. Obviously, during the time of slavery in uh, the United States, this uh, many of the uh, African-American spirituals from that time have to do with this. Go down Moses, go down to Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. It became a major symbol during the civil rights movement in the 60s. And so this has been a very significant story, not just for Jewish people or even for religious people, but having to do with human rights and human freedom. Now, it's also true that the, this event, the Exodus event, is the core event to the whole Jewish faith. In fact, their references to the, to the Exodus are said every day in Jewish prayers, the daily Jewish prayers for observant Jews. 
It is also the primary event for the most important of the annual Jewish celebrations or festivals, which is Passover or Pesach in Hebrew. The Passover event happened in Egypt that allowed the, the Jewish people to go out to leave captivity in Egypt and eventually, after 40 years of wandering around, they say that they wandered for 40 years because they were being led by a man and he would not stop and ask for directions. <laughs> but there are other reasons why they wandered for 40 years. It was because of disobedience. Again, there is no archaeological evidence, but maybe we can figure out why. Um, the Exodus story, as I said, I am the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 5 says, who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The entire history of the Jewish people after this was a recollection of what God did in the Exodus. You know, God is our God, we are his people. They would refer to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who brought us up out of slavery in Egypt. That constant reference that he brought us up out of slavery in Egypt, that's the Exodus event. And then in Judges, it says, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, that's uh, the ancient name for Arabia, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. This is the charter story of the Jewish people, and therefore also of the Christian people and of Islam. It all goes back, as we talked about this morning, to one man, and that is Abraham and his people. This is a photograph of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. You can tell which one's younger because their, their beards get shorter. As they're. So it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in Jacob's hand is a little portrait of one of his sons, the most important of his sons having to do with the Exodus story. This is the genealogy starting with Abraham's father, Terah. And you will notice, by the way, that Sarai and Abram, their first name, before it got changed to Sarah and Abraham, they were... Um, half brother and sister, same father, different mother. So, and that was very common back in those days that you would marry somebody who was a close relative. The uh, from there, Abraham and Hagar had Ishmael that we talked about, the father of the Arabic peoples and others, not just Arabs, but primarily the Arabic peoples. And then Abraham and Sarah had the son Isaac. Isaac had two sons that were twins, Esau, who was the father of the Edomites. No, I'm not going to get into all the Edomites and Amalekites and all the other ites that we have in there. And Jacob, Jacob, who's later was renamed Israel. Jacob had four wives and 12 sons plus one daughter, Dinah, who comes into the story here. But of these 12 sons, the next to the youngest was Joseph. Joseph was the next to the youngest, and he was a spoiled brat. Okay, uh, actually, I have these things. There's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then we want to talk about Joseph. Joseph was, um, from these 12 sons, the next to the youngest one was one of Jacob, Israel's favorite. And you know the story of uh, Joseph and the multicolored coat, right? He gave him all these presents, and the rest of the sons were sick and tired of this spoiled brat, always talking about how basically he was his father's favorite. So at one point, we have somewhere around <coughs> circa 1898, um, we have Joseph, the next of the youngest of the 12 sons, is sold by his brothers into slavery. They are so fed up with him. Judah, they were going to kill him. And the oldest son, Judah, convinces him, let's not kill him, let's just get rid of him. And so about that time, some traders from Midian come through, and they sell Joseph to them. He is carried off into slavery in Egypt. They carry him off into Egypt, and they sell him. And so Joseph is in Egypt, and at first he's a slave. Then he gets falsely accused because he refuses to sleep with his boss's wife when she tries to seduce him. He gets thrown in jail because she accuses him of all bad things. He's in jail for a while, and then he gets out. He prophesies, he, he actually interprets a dream that the Pharaoh has, and the Pharaoh is so impressed, he makes him the chief operating officer of all of Egypt second only to the Pharaoh in, ter in terms of being in charge. And so he is ruler under Pharaoh of all of Egypt because of hard work and, in and uh, integrity that he has. Then during a famine, after he's been in power a while, there is a famine up in Canaan. And Jacob sends some of his sons down to buy grain in Egypt because Egypt's doing really well because uh, Joseph was a really good manager. And they go down to buy grain. Eventually they discover that this is Joseph, you know, the, the primary 
guy in charge down there under the Pharaoh is actually their brother Joseph. And it ends up that Jacob and all of his clan, the other 11 brothers and all of their families are being moved down to Egypt and settled there. They're given prime land and the Pharaoh loves Joseph and he's taking care of their family. Well, that's all well and good until a few generations later, we have a new Pharaoh. The Hebrew Bible says there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. He didn't remember that previously Joseph had been um, loved by the pharaohs and run in the country. And so they start getting scared because the Hebrew people are having a lot of babies. There are going to be so many of them. The pharaoh puts them under oppression. He basically enslaves them, puts them to work. They have to work caring for um, the physical labor needs in Egypt because they don't remember the time of Joseph. Well, the Hebrews keep having babies. They keep growing. And so the Pharaoh gets really scared and he orders that every male Hebrew has to be thrown in the Nile, has to be drowned, killed. Well, because of that, about that time, 1526 or so, circa, Moses is born in Egypt and his mother is reluctant to throw her baby boy in the Nile to kill him. So she puts him in a basket, floats him along the reeds in the Nile, and he is found by Pharaoh's daughter, the story goes. This is Pharaoh's daughter, this is Moses. This is Miriam, Moses' older sister. She had been watching the basket where her brother was floating, and when Pharaoh's daughter goes out and finds him, she goes running out, and the, and the, the daughter, just a cute baby, cute Hebrew baby, who can just leave a baby out here? She's going to take him home. Miriam goes up and says, you know, I know a woman that could be wet nurse for that baby, for you to nurse him. And so Moses' own mother, Yahweh, ends up being his wet nurse, according to the story. He is raised in the house of Pharaoh as the, the stepson of Pharaoh's daughter, and he becomes a prince in Egypt. This is where you get, how many of you saw Exodus Gods and Generals, the Ridley Scott movie, recently? Oh, that's about right. <laughs> Six or seven of you. Okay. Um, it's actually a fun movie. I'm not, I'm not being critical of it. So he is raised as a prince in Egypt, but in 1486 circa, Moses is out. Apparently by this time he realizes he was originally Hebrew, and he sees a slave master, one of the Egyptian uh, taskmasters, beating, badly beating a uh, Hebrew. And he kills the Egyptian and buries his body in the sand. The next day, he goes out and he's telling somebody what to do and he goes, well, are you gonna kill me like you did that Egyptian? He finds out people know about it and he runs for it. He's 40 years old at this point. He runs off and goes to Midian, which is the old name for Arabia, and he meets a woman there, marries her, and ends up being a shepherd for her father's flocks. When he had been doing that, for 40 years, and by this time he's 80, of course the biblical accounts are people are lived a lot longer then. The story is that Moses lived to 120 eventually. There were 40 years after this. He is out caring for the flocks one day, and he sees this bush that's on fire, but it does not be, seem to be being consumed. So he goes out to it to check it out, and God speaks to him and says, Moses, take off your shoes. This is a holy place. And then he tells him, and by the way, you're going to see that bush, or at least the traditional one of that bush. <laughs> the burning bush, as the story goes, is in St. Catherine's Monastery. You can take a picture. Um, so, Moses is called by God to return to Egypt and let my people go. This is the passage in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Exodus. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egypts and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way of the, the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He comes up with all sorts of excuses why he shouldn't do this. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I, it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. That's why Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb in, in the Hebrew Bible, why that is believed to be where the law was given, Mount Sinai. So, uh, Moses goes down to Egypt and he confronts the Pharaoh 
And I can remember when I was younger, and I'm reading all this and thinking, how does this guy who was a shepherd end up getting, getting to go in and talk to Pharaoh anytime he wants to? And it occurred to me finally one day, well, if he was his stepbrother, he might have more access. And he was, according to the story. So he goes in and talks to him. There are various miracles that he performs, and the magicians of Pharaoh can do some of them, but then they come up short. And as we all know, Moses looked like Charlton Heston. <laughs> this is the image most people have of Moses, okay? I think he's got a pistol in his belt somewhere there. <laughs> Later on, he receives the law, as we know. And when he goes to Pharaoh and says, you know, let the Israelites go, let my people go, Pharaoh doesn't want to do it. And Moses warns him. Moses talks to him several times, and he won't do it. And finally God says, and God does not come to him as a little boy, like in the Ridley Scott movie, but God tells him, tell Pharaoh, either let my people go or else. And the else are the ten plagues that come upon Egypt. Um, in Exodus 7 through 11, there, first there is the plague where the Nile turns to blood, and in the, the recent movie, it's because the crocodiles go crazy and start eating everything, and then there's this huge spread of blood. And then there is the plague of frogs, then of lice and gnats, and then flies, then disease on cattle, boils and sores, hail, locusts, darkness, and the final of the ten plagues was the death of the firstborn, where the firstborn of every person, every family, and every animal dies. Now, this is where the Passover comes in. Because God instructs Moses to tell the Israelites to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood of that sacrificed lamb and paint it on the lentils and the doorposts of their houses. And that night as death, sometimes they talk about the angel of death, that's not really what the Hebrew Bible says, as death comes through, when the people have the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and lentils, the death passes over them. That's where we get Passover, the Hebrew word Pesach, because death passed over them, but claimed the life of the firstborn of every household and every animal, including the firstborn of Pharaoh. Very interesting little fact. There have been a number of natural disasters, and I'm not saying this is what happened, but a number, it's interesting, a number of natural disasters uh, that we know of, some of them in recent years, that very much followed this kind of pattern. In 1986, Lake Nyos in northwest Cameroon in Africa. Lake Nyos um, had a large release of carbon monoxide underneath the lake. It's called a limnic explosion. And this carbon monoxide was, re uh, was released underneath the lake. What happened is, first, um, it created iron oxide. The, the iron that was in the water and in the soil was oxidized, rusted very quickly, and it turned the water red. Then, that increase in um, minerals and uh, particularly carbon monoxide in the water killed all the fish. Any of the animals that were like amphibious, like frogs, left the lake. And so there's this huge exodus of frogs. Then they had, because of all the dead, you know, what happens when you get a lot of dead fish floating on the water? They ended up with flies and gnats as a result of that. And then, because of the release of carbon monoxide and other gases from this thing, they ended up with both people and animals suffering skin diseases, particularly boils. And lastly, at night, when the carbon monoxide finally seeped out of this lake, and all of this is recorded, they have photographic evidence of all this, I'm not making this up. When this carbon monoxide leaked out at night, because carbon monoxide is heavier than air and it stays low, as people were asleep, 1,746 people died in their beds, and 3,500 animals died in their stalls. So, really interesting, I think. You know, there are a few, they didn't have hail or locusts or darkness, but they had quite a bit of other, other things that seemed to relate to that. So, maybe that's how God did it. Um, <laughs> so, Pharaoh, after the death of his firstborn, like in the movie, he said, go! Get out of here! Leave! I don't want to see you anymore! And they all load up, and they leave. Moses leads them out. Now, here we run into a problem in terms of the story. The scripture in Numbers says there were 603,550 men aged 20 and up. That doesn't count the women, or the children, or the animals, or any of the non-Israelites that went with them, because there were a lot of those. 
What that would mean is if you have 603,550 men aged 20 and up, you would probably have a total group of people in excess of 2 million people. Well, at that time, there were only 3.5 million people in Egypt. Not only that, but if um, 2 million people are walking 10 abreast, it would make a line 150 miles long. So there probably were not 603,000 people. So how do we deal with that? There's a couple of ways. Some people have interpreted the ancient Hebrew as saying actually 600 families, family groups in other words. But the most likely interpretation is in Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Old Testament, they and the Kabbalah, the mystic, uh, the mystic Jewish interpretations deal with this a lot. There's a thing called the gematria. All of the Hebrew numbers and letters are related. So that for every number, there is a letter that it represents, and vice versa. So a gematria would be a letter code which can be translated into words. If you take 603,550 and you do the gematria translation, it ends up being benai Yisrael kol rosh, which means the children of Israel, every individual. So it's very likely that that number did not mean literally that many people, but rather that that was a gematria for the children of Israel, every individual. Otherwise, very hard to understand how that could be the case. Well, after they leave, Pharaoh realizes what he's done, just like in the movie, and he decides, all of our workforce has just left. I'm gonna go get them back. Although in the movie, he says, I don't expect any survivors. He's planning on killing them in revenge. This is what the Israelites were facing. You are going to see this. In Luxor, this is on the wall, the outside pylon wall of the Temple of Luxor. This is actually Ramses II, who I don't think was, despite a lot of people's ideas, I don't think that was the Pharaoh. But this is the way it would have looked, what you would have been looking at if you were being chased by Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his army and his chariots. So Pharaoh and his chariots, they go out after them, and the Israelites realize they're being chased by the Egyptian army. They're scared to death, and they immediately start blaming Moses for all of this. And this is what Exodus says. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Moses turns to God, and God says, What is your problem? Have you not figured out by now that it'll be okay? Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground and a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. You notice it does not say that Pharaoh did. Uh, I, I think that's important. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. So the whole army is covered with the floodwaters of the sea and destroyed, and the Israelites escaped. Now the interesting thing is that there are over 50 place names in the book of Exodus about where these people were traveling. Of those 50, more than 50 names, we only can clearly identify three of them in terms of any modern location. We know where they started, we know where they ended up, and we know one place in the middle. Other than that, the question as to where this actually happened, where they, where they went to, has always been a mystery. Um, there are 15 different locations that are identified as being Mount Sinai. Where we're going is the traditional one, the one that has always been most accepted. But the question of, did it happen? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Has always been a fascination to people. Uh, the, one of the reasons why this has been a question is where, according to this biblical account, and the reason I'm reading these passages is because this is the report we have. And that's where we start. When we read this biblical account, we have to ask the question, where would they have crossed that there was enough water to drown an army? And yet, assuming for a minute that we believe this could have happened, and yet that the people could have actually crossed. Most of the Red Sea 
whether you're talking about the main body, the Gulf of Suez, or the Gulf of Aqaba, the two northern arms, are very deep. In fact, in many, most places, it gets as deep as a mile deep. Well, the problem is, with the width being a mile deep, you'd have to walk down 60 degrees for a mile and then back up 60 degrees, because it's very steep. And so there's serious questions, assuming for a minute it did happen, where might it have happened? There's always been a fascination with this. It is a critically important myth, but artists have represented this for thousands of years. I mean, we have ancient representations. This is a sort of classic representation. Obviously, there have been a lot of movies about this. You know, Charlton Heston, Ridley Scott, there's a lot, been a lot of this. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> You'll notice the sign over here, which is a symbol for you know, water over the vehicle. Um, it said, you can't read this, but it says Moses transport. And back it says, caution, Joseph's bones. Because it says that Moses and the Israelites took Joseph's bones back, they were taking it back to Israel. So this is one idea of what might have happened, assuming that it happened recently. And I love this, it's Gary Larson. The caption is, Moses as a kid, <laughs> parting his milk, right? Um, great Gary Larson, okay? So, a lot of fascination with this whole idea how it happened, when it happened, where it happened, or if it happened at all. Um, now, so let's look at, first, did it occur? There are three ways we can approach this. There is the traditional understanding about did it happen, when did it happen, where did it happen. There is the alternate version, and then there is the non-traditional version. According to the traditional version, it definitely did happen. And as I mentioned to you this morning, there was a, we had an Islamic guide, very sharp woman, she was excellent. I hope we get her again when we're in Luxor. Um, and she is Islamic, and she said, absolutely, I believe it happened. Because it's in the Hebrew Bible, it's in the Quran. So, that traditionally, yes. Alternate is maybe, non-traditional, a very much modern sort of view, and especially the scholarly view, is no, it didn't happen, because there's no archaeological evidence. I'll get to that. So, did it occur? When did it occur? Um, I, I, let's, let's address some of those things first. Is, if you read the Bible, you have to be careful not to read any ancient writing, the Hebrew Bible or anything else, that is before 500 BC as being history, the way we understand history. History in the way we think of it, which means a neutral recording of events in sort of a chronological order, I mean, that's what we think history is. Prior to the fifth century BC, that was not what they did with history. History was written to present one side, you know, what they wanted you to hear. Um, in the 5th century, you have the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides writing about the Persian War and the Peloponnesian War. They're the ones that invented modern history. Prior to that, we always need to understand that the intention wasn't to present some neutral representation. That's true when, when we read the Bible as well. But we need to recognize that um, something happened. The Jewish people came from somewhere. Okay? And, and a lot of these events, there was too much... Too much um, writing on it for simply to have been made up, I believe. The fact is that as we look at the, there is no archaeological evidence for this, but some people claim that that in itself is absolute evidence that nothing happened. It, well, they weren't really there. The Israelites were never in Egypt because they say there's no strict evidence or no clear evidence, archaeological, that they were there. But there's several things we need to recognize. One, ancient, because history back then was not the way we think of as history, Ancient writings never virtually, well, I, don't, I can't think of a single instance where ancient writings reflected anything negative about the ruling party or any defeat. They never recorded defeats. Everything was either a win or it wasn't mentioned. And in fact, um, the, we have examples. I mentioned the Assyrian king Sennacherib, who when I showed you that Judah, the little kingdom of Judah, was the only part that Assyria didn't conquer, well, Sennacherib went back to Assyria, and the way they recorded that was, I defeated this king, and this king, and this king, and this king, and I pinned King Hezekiah up in the city of Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. First example I know of a political spin. He couldn't say he defeated him, but he wouldn't allow them to say he, he couldn't defeat him, so he pinned him up like a bird in a cage. So they never recorded failures. This was especially true in Egypt, because in Egypt, the fact that they had so many hieroglyphs, and you're going to see this, there's so much written material 
in Egypt, they thought that writing itself was like magic. It made things real. If you wrote something down, that made it real. If it was not written, it wasn't real. That is why in Egypt, and you'll see some of this, when a new monarch, a new pharaoh would come along, if he didn't like what had happened previously or he didn't like the previous pharaoh or leader, they often would chisel their image off of the walls because it's in stone. You can't just write over it. Or if events, they would try to erase them because if it was no longer written, then it was no longer true. It no longer happened. They believed that strongly. And so the Egyptians especially would never have recorded something that must have amounted to a defeat if the Israelites really were successful in getting out of Egypt. It's also perhaps true that we will find more evidence later. The Hittites, until the early 20th century, were thought to be a myth. Now we know for a fact they were very significant uh, peoples. So we may still find something. It's also true that saying the Israelites weren't in Egypt, this never happened because we don't have any record of it in writing or any archaeological evidence, that's a, called an argument from silence. You don't have evidence that it didn't happen, you just don't have evidence that it did happen. And that is always considered a very bad argument against something. And so we're, we have to sort of take all of that with a grain of salt. The only record we have, either way, is the indication in the Hebrew Bible and in the Quran that these events really happened. So, did it occur? And when did it occur? There's two theories about when it occurred, and they're reflected here in this traditional and alternate. Uh, the original idea was that this happened in the 15th century BC, 1446 is the usual date, I'll tell you why. But in the 20th century, William Albright, who in the 1930s, he was the, the dean of Holy Land archaeology. He's the one that pretty much invented Holy Land archaeology. He began to examine this, and he decided he thought it might have happened instead of the 15th century BC. It happened in the 13th century BC, around 1250. Later on, we had there was a back and forth in the 1930s. John Garstang, another very important archaeologist, said no. He saw evidence for 15th century based upon things that happened in Canaan, the, whole, the Promised Land, once they got there. Kathleen Kenyon came along in the 1950s and she said that in the absence of certain kinds of pottery in Canaan, she didn't think that this had all happened. And then later, I, I think I mentioned this before, uh, an archaeologist named Jody Magnus has a program in the, you know the Learning Company? You guys know the Learning Company? I love those things. Well, there's one on ancient Israel, and an archaeologist named Jody Magnus does, and she's talking about Jericho, the first place that the Israelites were supposed to have conquered when they got into the, into the uh, Promised Land. And she says, this can't be true because uh, Jericho did not have a wall around it. It was not a walled city in the 13th century, in other words, in the 1200s, because the wall apparently had been destroyed at least 200 years before that. Hmm. I listen to her and I go, wait a minute, you're saying, because she assumes this later day, that Jericho could not have been destroyed when the end of the Promised Land because the walls had been destroyed 200 years before that. <laughs> and that fits right into the traditional idea. Um, and sometimes they just sort of overlook that. The, in addition to them exiting Egypt and coming into the Promised Land, there was also a period of time that lasted a couple hundred years in which the Israelites then conquered the land of Canaan. And so some of the destruction might have happened when they were conquering the land of Canaan. But did it happen? When did it happen? I'm inclined to think that it did happen in the earlier date, that it happened in the 15th century BC, and I'll tell you why. This is a passage in 1 Kings, the sixth chapter. It says, it, it, in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, very specific, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, this gets down to the, the very month, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. Well, we know from other records when the Sol Solomonic temple was being built. If, and that was in 966 BC. I'm sorry, those of you who can't see down here. And so if we back up from that 480 years, we end up with the Exodus happening in 1446. That's why it's the traditional day. That would put it during the reign of Thutmose III, who reigned from 1479 to 1425 BC. Now there is no other evidence that indicates to us that this very specific reference in the Hebrew Bible can't be relied upon. 
the only thing that they really suggest as being what one well, of the reason they thought it might be later is because they talk about the Israelites working on two storage cities. One is called Pithom, and one of them is named Ramesses, the city of Ramesses. Well, Ramesses II came along in the 1200s. And so they say, well, Ramesses, uh, the city of Ramesses must have been built during the time of Ramesses. But it is very common in writing to go back and rename places to the more modern name when you're talking about them. I'll give you an example. If you ever read a history of, the, of New York City, and you read about it, and they'll talk about, well, New York City was founded in blah, 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 blah. They may mention the fact that originally it was called New Amsterdam. But, or they may not, because we know it as New York, and if they're talking about New York City, they'll call it New York City, not New Amsterdam, because that just kind of gets confusing. The same thing happens in biblical places. Um, later on, if a city or a place got renamed, they would use the new name, not the old name, even though it may have had a different name when the events actually occurred. We find that in several other places. And so there may be an excuse for why the city was named Ramses, even though that would not fit in with the timetable of Thutmose III. There are two other uh, uh, archaeological, the suggestion there's no archaeological evidence is not quite true. There's something called the Merneptha Steli. Merneptha was a uh, pharaoh who came after Thutmose III. These are all New Kingdom um, pharaohs. He was the son of Ramses II, and he was the pharaoh in the 13th century BC. The Merneptha Steli, a steli is a stone tablet or a stone standing, a standing stone. This records the successes that Pharaoh Merneptha had in conquering people in the region of Canaan. It is the uh, first reference, the earliest mention of the nation of Israel. So in the 1200s, the Merneptha Steli tells us that the Pharaoh Merneptha conquered Israel. The exact statement on the Steli of Merneptha is, quote, Israel is desolated, his seed is not, Palestine has become a widow for Egypt. What that means is, by the late 1200s, Israel as a nation was apparently sufficiently established in the land of Canaan that they are referred to by name by a pharaoh, which suggests that they didn't just get there 30 years or so before this. They must have been there for a while to be acknowledged as a people. There's also what's called the Amarna letters. Uh, we've talked about, and we'll talk more later about um, Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV, he was a pharaoh who tried to promote monotheism. He moved the capital city to Amarna. They have found in Amarna a bunch of clay tablets that were sent to him when he was pharaoh, and they controlled the land of Canaan, technically. These are letters written from various people who were under the authority of Egypt saying, we are being invaded by these people called the Hapiru, and they're conquering our cities, and we need you to come and help. Well, this takes place in the 1300s, during the time when the Hebrew people were conquering cities in Canaan. They, were, they, they didn't get all of the place at one time, they had to fight for it. Well, Hapiru sounds a lot like Hebrew, and it is exactly the right time period, and it, it accurately describes what was happening with the descendants of Joshua conquering the land of Canaan. It's not exact proof, but it does sort of suggest it. The last thing we would question we'd ask is where might it have happened? Traditionally, it's understood to have been north of the Gulf of Suez, which is that uh, western arm north, uh, the, in the northwestern leg of the uh, Red Sea. Alternate north of Suez, non-traditional says it didn't happen. The description says that it was the crossing of the Yam Suf in Hebrew. And traditionally, Yam Suf is interpreted Red Sea. That's not actually accurate. Yam Suf, Suf means read, R-E-E-D, not R-E-D. And so some scholars have said, if it's the Reed Sea, reeds don't grow in salt water, typically, and so it must have been a freshwater lake that they crossed, not the Red Sea, which is salt water. And so it has been proposed that they crossed Lake Timsa, there's several lakes here, or the Bitter Lake, maybe the northern Gulf of Suez. There are some reeds that do grow in salt water, or even Lake Barrowell <coughs> up here, and that it wasn't a large body of water. Well, we run into a little problem there because the story says that Pharaoh and his armies were overwhelmed by the returning waters that were flooded. 
The thing is, first, um, and because of that, this is some of the traditional routes. There are a lot of different trade routes that go through the Sinai Peninsula and the desert. The, these are some of the different options that have been proposed. This is the traditional route that's accepted, that they crossed some water somewhere up in here. They came down and went to Mount Sinai, uh, uh, Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses, which is right next to uh, Jebel Katarina, Catherine's mountain. And then they came up, they wandered around for 40 years because they wouldn't ask for directions, and then they ended up going up here to the, to the Promised Land. Now, the thing that's not taken into account here is that, again, in 1 Kings, they refer to a lot up here, which is a city at the southern tip of Israel, as being where King Solomon had boats built. And in that passage where it's talking about King Solomon having boats built, it calls the Gulf of Aqaba, it wasn't called that then, but they refer to the Gulf of Aqaba as the Yam Suf. So the suggestion is that it might have been the Gulf of Aqaba that was where they crossed. The name matches. It's also true that Paul, the Apostle Paul in the Galatians 4th chapter, refers to Sinai being in Arabia. Arabia is not here. Arabia is over here, the ancient land of Midian. Now, it's true that sometimes they refer to all of this as Arabia. But this is Midian. This is Arabia. You even see the letters there on this map, Midian. And it was in the land of Midian that Moses had been when he got the call of God. And he's supposed to have gone back there. So there has been a, much, a, a, a new idea that perhaps the crossing was actually over the Gulf of Aqaba. And there's several reasons why that sort of makes sense. One is, let me catch up with my notes here. Um, one of them is because it says to us that when they crossed over, they crossed out of Egyptian territory. And once they crossed the waters, they were free from Pharaoh and his army because they were no longer in Egyptian-controlled territory. Well, Egypt controlled Sinai, all of it. They did not control Arabia. And so that seems to make sense. Um, the, the name Midian we usually refer to Arabia. In Galatians, Paul refers to Sinai being in Arabia, and the Gulf of Aqaba has enough water to drown an army, whereas that's not true of any of those lakes that were up north. The worst that would have been happened is they would have gotten clogged in the mud. So some people have suggested that this was the route, and that they crossed at the Straits of Tehran, which is the mouth of the Gulf of Aqaba, here. We're going we're gonna to go this whole distance and end up right there uh, in Aqaba, the town of Aqaba. The problem is that the Straits of Tehran are very deep. And that's one of those places that if this were accurate, they would have been walking down 60 degrees and then back up 60 degrees, even though it's not very far from one side or the other. That doesn't seem very likely. But it has been figured out there is a place more than midway up the Gulf of Aqaba called Nueva. There is a trail through the wilderness that seems to match the description of the wilderness that Moses and the Israelites traveled through with Pharaoh chasing them. Here, at a place called Nueva, there is a large beach. It's the only place along this very rugged coast that a group of people could probably gather. And this area at Nueva there is kind of an underwater land bridge. It is much shallower right there for a, a period, a place. And so if the water were rolled back, there would not be the steep decline and incline to cross over there. So you've got a beach where the people could gather. You've got, there'd be crossing into non-Egyptian territory. There is a shallower area here that would work. And a number of different sort of explorers and scholars have checked this out, and they have done underwater examination there. They claim to have found what appear to be chariot wheels and human bones and other kinds of artifacts. They cannot remove any of them because that's not permitted. They cannot, oh, sorry. They can't do more research over here because the nation of Saudi Arabia will not allow that. But they claim to have found pillars with markings honoring, um, honoring the, the Hebrew people over here. There is a mountain here that's uh, named Jebel al-Laws, which is the mountain of the law in Arabic, um, that is described as having a blackened, photograph showed having a blackened top, and that's consistent with the description that is in the uh, book of Exodus. This is another sort of cumulative map where it shows the wilderness that they might have traveled through, the beach of Nueva right there. You can actually see this in the, uh, the aerial photographs. The, eye, the suggested crossing where they have 
There's photographic evidence that they've seen what appear to be chariot wheels and other things underwater. The idea that uh, Mount Sinai might be Jabal Allah's with the burnt peak. Yam Suf is referred to, the Gulf of Aqaba is referred to as Yam Suf in the Book of Kings. And then the, the idea that Paul referred to Mount Sinai being in Arabia. We are going to visit Mount Sinai in Sinai, over here. And it's a spectacular place, it's historic, it is the traditional location, and I think that's cool. I'm not trying to dispossess you from that. But I think it's very interesting, the possibility that it may actually, they may actually have crossed the sea, it would have been shallower there, there may be a different location. As I say, there's at least 15 different locations that have been proposed for Mount Sinai. We will be visiting the traditional one, and it is a, a very, very cool place. You'll really enjoy that. But it's something to think about, something to play with, something interesting, I think, when we recognize, and I believe that there's history here. I believe that we cannot completely discount the Hebrew Bible or the Quran when they tell this story. Something happened. Maybe someday we'll learn more. Any questions about any of that? Yes, up in the back first. Why can't they get something so important? Why can't they go down and get a few uh, wagon wheels and say, yep, this is it? Because the, this, this is owned by Egypt and by Saudi Arabia, most of it by Saudi Arabia, and they do not allow anything to be removed. We have, we have, you can go online and look this up. Now, one of the reasons why this has been scoffed at is the first person who claimed to have figured this out was kind of a nut. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he did not receive much credible response. But there have been a bunch of other people since then, including some Scandinavian scholars, uh, who, have, who have gone down with diving gear and have gotten photographs. Um, for instance, gold does not, does not accumulate carbuncles and stuff like that underwater. And so they've got some things that appear to be completely free of that. And some of the wheels of the of Pharaoh's chariots, they say, were plated with gold. And so there are things like that that they get into. Um, I didn't bring any of those images and stuff because how far can I go with this, with, with you all being patient? But you might want to look it up online. And they can't, they're not allowed to remove anything. All they can do is photograph it. And they have not been allowed to follow over into Saudi Arabia because the, the uh, Saudi government will not allow that. Some people who have been in Saudi for work permits or everything have sort of wandered around and they've seen these things and reported on them, but they're not allowed to take photographs for the most part. They're not allowed to retrieve any physical evidence. And so, as of yet, we're not able to do anything else with that. You had a question? I just was curious. Uh, obviously, Egypt was a nation for many, many years that employed large numbers of slaves. Mm -hmm. were, were the, were the, I just don't know this. Were the Israeli slaves considered separate from all of the other slaves? And every time they fought a war, they came back with uh, yeah, there would have been a lot of slaves. You're, the, the question was, were the Israelites considered a different you know, group of slaves than others? Um, the, the story, the account is that when the Israelites left, there were a lot of non-Israelites that went with them. They have, may have been other slaves that were tagging along, uh, but we don't have any other records of that. You know, The Hebrew Bible does not get into details about other groups of people that were there, but it's true. They had slaves throughout their whole history in terms of the Pharaoh dynasties. So. Romans have the Spartacus slave revolt. You know, I mean, it was disrupted yes. everything in the society. Right, it, it did. I'm Spartacus. No, I'm Spartacus. You know, we should watch that movie too. Any other questions? Yes? The trail off the back seems rather long. How long would it have taken them to get from the point to the How long would it have taken them? I should know an answer to that, and I don't have a good one. I mean, it would have been weeks and weeks. This, would, this did not happen, you know, uh, immediately, um, particularly because it's that many people and, you know, they, they, including women and children and animals and the whole thing. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It would have been a long track. And like I say, uh, if, if we interpret it as having been two million people, which I don't, I don't believe it was two million people, I think there are other inter ways to interpret that, then, you know, you're talking about a massive number of people uh, in terms of length of line. So, yes. Is that desert up there? Why didn't they cross above the Gulf of Aqaba? Why didn't they go above? Well, the, there was a, a number of different, in fact, let me go back. This gives, all of these different routes that have been at various times proposed were all trading routes. And the reason those were the trading routes is in most cases it's because there are oases along the way. There's water. That's the big problem here. You didn't just strike out across the desert and hope you were going to make it. You had to have some plan. 
All of these are very trading routes, and some of them have names. This is called the Way of the Land of the Philistines, because if you follow, or, uh, if you follow this way, it t carries up to the cities of, uh, of the Philistines. There is the, you know, the Way of Shuf, there is the King's Highway, various names for these. And so some people have proposed one route or another as being the way that they, they got there. And if they took different routes, that means that there's different interpretations as to where they ended up. As I say, we have only been able to, to clearly identify the starting place, where they ended up in Kadesh Barnea, which is here, and one point midway. But any of these could have satisfied those expectations. Um, and that's why there's always a huge controversy about it. We don't know. But these were the standard trading routes which they probably would have followed. It does say in the Hebrew Bible that they did not take the way of the Philistines because that's the way that they would have been expected to go. If they were making a straight line from this area, the land of Goshen and Ramesses, if they were making a run for Canaan, then they would have gone this way. But they knew that's what was expected, and so they were trying to go a way that the Pharaoh would not expect them to go. That's indicated in the Hebrew Bible. Other questions? Yes? With that many people making an exodus, it shouldn't have been too difficult for the Egyptians to figure out what route they were taking. Right. I mean, that the, they didn't know when they first left if Pharaoh was going to chase them or not. He didn't make that decision until they were already gone. But... Um, the suggestion is they knew it's possible they could still be in trouble. And so they sort of did a head fake and went the direction that they, they thought he might not be able to decide they were going that way. He did, according to the account. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? How wide is the waterway where the land bridge is? Uh, this area here? Let me move forward. Um, this is a better one, I think. That, um, you're looking, that would be probably 20 miles. You know, so it's a pretty good walk. But remember, this was a time that, in, where everyone walked everywhere. I mean, the, the, to, do, to walk all day was customary for these folks. And they had been slaves. They were used to working ours. So they, they, it would be about a 20-mile crossing there. Okay. Tomorrow night, when we go through the Bab el Mandi, um, that's about a 25-mile wide section. So you can sort of make a comparison on the maps to that. Any other questions? Okay, I, um, as I said before, I think this stuff is really fun and interesting. So I'm presenting to you and I hope you'll find it interesting as well. And this is important because it has been a symbol, not only as the, the sort of charter story of the, the Jewish people, but important to all three of the main monotheistic religions. And it has continued to be an important symbolic event for so many people since then. So, Thank you all for being here, and we will see you tomorrow when we talk about Islam.